Again, I place the tool in as close to the lock as possible. And before I can drive the tool in, and then we break the lock and open it. <laughs> So first starting with the um, with the entry drill, um, where did that come from and how has it improved? Okay, yeah, we um, we were looking at getting some some purpose, uh, some equipment that's specifically for for making entry into buildings. So we asked the police to give us a, uh, a rundown on the sort of equipment that they use. They showed us a demonstration at their training uh, establishment, which is in on the RAF bases in. Uh, in, in the, the north of the county and the equipment that they showed us we were quite impressed with it, it offered us a controlled method of entry into buildings whereas in the past we've made do with the equipment that we have on the appliances so we decided to buy certain items of equipment they they demonstrated to us they offered us free training for our instructors we built a training rig to to be able to practice on uh, and we went from there really and you said it's now been rolled out across the whole service it is, yeah. Training as it as and when the equipment was delivered, we, we made sure that the crews were fully trained before they got the equipment. Uh, that was done on a concentrated training course. Basically, we just got pumps in here for an hour at a time. It was a very quick demonstration. It's not rocket science how to use the kit. It's, mm -hmm. it's common sense. So we rolled them through. Probably in less than in less than three weeks, we got every crew through. Okay, great. And how's that? Um, how often has it been used out on instances so far? We don't keep a record of when the equipment's actually being used, but I would assume that it's being used every time that people make an entry into a building now, That's more great. or less. And uh, what do you think the, so what difference it made to have worked in, either in terms of in safety, time of entry? It probably saves time, but again, we haven't made any record of the difference in time that it's taking to get people into buildings. Uh, it would definitely be being done safe more safely and, and, and in time we'll probably have safety records to reflect that. I'm not sure what the figures are for people being injured gaining entry. I suspect there's a lot of injuries that aren't reported gaining entry, fingers and things that people don't, are too embarrassed to report. Uh, so I don't think we'll ever be able to measure but it, it's without a doubt just watching it you can see it's a much more controlled and safe method of making entry into the building. Cool. And then going on to the, the ladder training, um, what's the background to that? You said it came from the, the CFI report. Yeah, CFO I think recognised that since the, the old carry down method was taken out of, of, of the system that was in the, the old uh, manuals of firemanship, it wasn't replaced with anything and there was nothing official out there to tell people how to get people out of a building uh, without having to put a load of safety measures in place. So CFO had a working group that came up with these three methods uh, of, of getting people down a ladder safely, two for people that are unconscious and one for conscious casualties. Uh, and they released a paper with those recommendations on it. So we then rolled that training out to our uh, stations. And uh, so how far in terms of that training have you done? You said there's issues with going from, from dummy to, to live casualty. Yeah, we decided that really we needed to get some training out immediately because we'd gone that length of time without actually teaching people how to get people out of the building down the ladder safely. So we thought that a quick win would to send instructors out to stations uh, and train with a dummy. So that we, we had that as phase one. So instructors went out to all the stations, trained with a dummy. The only uh, safety measure we put in was a line around the dummy in case the person ca carrying the dummy became unstable and we needed to take the weight off of them. And that was just a safety measure. Uh, we're now on phase two, which is where we are doing live carry down. So every person in the fire service, operational person in the fire service, will do a live carry down on their station uh, and every phase one trainee will do live carry down as part of their phase one training. In order to do that, for, for safety reasons, we've had to attach safety lines to both the casualty and the dummy, but of course that's not what it would be in a real life situation. So because of that, it's taken a little bit longer and uh, we don't think we'll have finished training everybody in phase two till the end of March next year. So um, again, how much how much safer and how much more time do you think they can save for? I don't know about time, but we didn't have an official method. I suspect that some of the, the, the methods that we were teaching, some people just did anyway, because they're sort of common sense, so they were being done anyway. It's just that we've now introduced uh, training that tells people what the correct methods of doing, using those particular ways of getting people down ladders are. 
Uh, in the past, it was it was just make it up as you went along, really, because there was nothing in the in the drill book. So, and you said that's quite new, so it's not necessarily something many other services are. We've had inquiries from other fire and rescue services as to what we're doing, so I'm assuming that those fire and rescue services are also delivering training and, and Tom Crick for the ladder. But it, it only came out, uh, I believe, earlier this year or late last year. So uh, actually, I think it was late last year. So it, it's it is a chance that a lot of fire and rescue services haven't actually started implementing it yet. And then finally, the foam, uh, the foam recovery, uh, seems a very innovative system, Tessa. It's. It's a basic response to the Water Resources Act. Uh, since the Water Resources Act came out, we've not been able to do foam training on any, uh, any of our stations or any of our training facilities because none of them dealt with the training foam adequately to, to fall in line with the Water Resources Act. So we had to find, uh, we, we had to install a system that would allow people to train with foam uh, and not break the law, basically. So. We, changed, we did have a foam training area here, but it went to a soak away, which obviously was against the, what's laid down in the, in the Act. Uh, and that's been modified so that the foam that's used in that training area is now flushed to the sewerage system. And we have an understanding with the sewerage undertakers in the area that we can flush a certain amount of training foam into the fluid, uh, sewerage system each year. So it's all, um, it's all quite a lot of interoperable working and uh, working with other services and also partner agencies. How important is that to uh, being able to work training on a budget? It's, it's, that's, that's an interesting one on, on, on the budget. I, um, I don't think that, we do a lot of training with the police here. We do some training with the, with the heart teams. Uh, I don't think we save money by it, but we become a better service by it. Um, we do an awful lot of training with the police and we, we share water training uh, with them, we, we train uh, their police officers in, in power boat handling and uh, swift water and uh, level two response. We also um, train their protester removal team in working at height techniques to keep them safe when they're removing protesters. Uh, and there's a couple of other things that we do with them as well. So we don't actually save money by it. In fact, we we probably we probably break even. We, we, they, they generally join us on our training. We do run some courses specifically for them. Uh, and in return, they do some training specifically for our interagency liaison officers, which uh, they also deliver.